Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to Know Your Gear Live QA episode 333. <laughs> so that's my, yeah, <laughs> 334. <laughs> it's three. So when I jump on, uh, I don't see the screen you guys see. I see this uh, status screen showing me how well it's linking up. And of course, um, there's a little bit in the way. I don't see the number. So there you go, 334. How are you guys doing? I hope you're doing great. I hope you guys have a fantastic week. My week was fun, crazy, and uh, I'm excited uh, for, uh, I think I'm excited for the weekend. Um, so uh, what do we got? We got a lot of stuff. We got some early subject questions. We got some stuff that came in during the week. We got some stuff we could probably talk about if it's you know guitar related. There's all kinds of cool stuff to going on. Um, I'm trying to think if I should just dive right in. Yeah, let's just dive right into it. Let's just get into it. No, no lollygag. And first thing I just want to share always, if you see somebody with their name in blue with a wrench, it means they're moderator um, and they're kind of monitoring things and checking things. And also um, they're uh, sending me uh, messages. They can send me like a question I missed or something that they, you know, they think is interesting as well. So keep in mind, they're also looking for your questions as well. And uh, and we'll get, we'll get into it. Let's start with uh, the very first question I saw. So the first one came from Jeremy C who says, Hey Phil, what do you think about Sterling? Uh, so his music man Sterling's is, is uh, Sterling is like the SE equivalent of, of a music man uh, blowing out the CT 50 for 399. I reviewed that guitar when I reviewed, I think it was four, 549 or 599. So that's a significant de decrease in price. It's a great deal on such a well-made guitar. Same logic as PRS question mark. Yeah, I'm sure they've got a lot. Look, there's a lot of import inventory. There's a consistent, what I'm seeing consistent, or I see consistently um, out there is lots of uh, import inventory um, in the US, lots of that inventory, but still not a lot of the USA made inventory seems to be um, still running backlogs. In other words, um, the weights are shrinking. They're catching up, but um, they're not <laughs> because uh, they, uh, although the orders are slowing down, I think a lot of them are having trouble across the country. I keep hearing the same message over and over and over again from every manufacturer that it's hard to keep employees right now, right? It's a tough market still to keep uh, confident, you know, qualified people doing the job, but um, they're still having trouble getting those orders done. And I'm, I'm pretty sure it's pretty consistent for every manufacturer. So U.S. Uh, made guitars are still back ordered for the most part and import guitars seem to be in warehouses full. So it's a good time to, if you're interested in those SEs, those Paul Reed Smith SEs we talked about last week, um, you know, getting 20% off this Sterling seems like it's a pretty decent deal. I would be looking for them. And I, we talked about this a few weeks ago too. If you're inter in the market for those guitars, just be aware that there's a lot of retailers out there and of course the manufacturers that would like to thin down the inventory and you should be able to get yourself a little bit of you know money in your pocket save some money and put it in your in your pocket or keep in your pocket so don't just blindly buy right now when obviously they're willing to to uh, save you some money so they can get rid of some inventory um, but I think it's a cool deal I like that guitar a whole lot um, that was one of the guitars when I think back of reviews I've done that sticks out is like, oh yeah, that was a good guitar. That was a good video. I was really happy with it. Um, this machine kills fast. It says my CT50 needs new pots. That possible. They might need to be cleaned. I don't know. It's, you know, bad potentiometers. Potentiometers going out are not super common, but obviously can happen usually through age, you know, wear and tear. They can wear out. They wear out their wearable parts. Um, if they use inexpensive parts in the beginning, because again, you know, if your guitar was built, this is what we keep talking about. I talk about all during COVID. If your guitar was built during COVID, I don't care if it was made in the USA or if it was in Germany or, you know, Japan or Indonesia or wherever, um, you're probably going to see things, not only uh, issues where maybe the employees were rushed, where they were probably understaffed or where something was missed. Um, stresses were high, tensions were high. Uh, uh, you know, everything was, everything was happening. You can imagine it could happen. You know, we were all there. We saw it. Um, but that's not just the, the only issue. The, uh, issue is also, they were all having trouble getting parts. You know, they were getting tons of orders and not getting parts. So there's a lot of uh, what I would call like off spec guitar stuff out there. You know, 
Um, I don't want to say, because like I said, during COVID, one of the things I did, and I was upfront about this uh, when I was doing reviews, was I kind of lightened my, you know, I wasn't as heavy handed with, you know, kind of slapping people for the mistakes because of the fact that everybody was doing more mistakes. It was par for the course. And, um, you know, it's like, you know, if you wanted your instrument, if you wanted your guitar, it was going to come with a couple of issues. So I saw a lot of them during COVID. However, um, other things I don't know if I talk about during COVID that I saw was a lot of, like I said, different specific specified parts in things. Um, because again, they were using what they have. I have a, an actual expensive guitar amplifier and, um, <laughs> it's, I'm laughing cause, um, I don't know if I'm impressed or, you know, it sucks. I think I'm impressed. So, you know, um, anyway, something happened, a knob fell off of it. it you know, it was like the, uh, the Allen screw got loose and the knob fell off. I pulled the knob off and I noticed that the, <laughs> the potentiometer shaft was cut <laughs> and it was cut at an angle. It wasn't cut very good. And that's why the knob fell off because the knob wasn't seating far enough back. Um, so I, I fixed it, you know, I get out and I, I took my Dremel out and I just kind of smoothed it flat. Okay. Cut it flat. And then I decided to pull off the other knobs. And what I noticed was, uh, that there was all kinds of different types of potentiometers, <laughs> solid shafts, split shafts, long shafts that were then cut. Um, cause I'm sure they were trying to get any of the actual potentiometers they could that are good. And this is a $3,000 amp. And so, um, I went through the amp. It works well. It sounds well, but it is obviously, it's very obvious that they were probably using whatever they could get their hands on that was working for them. So, um, and of course, if you look on the data on my amp, it's literally like smack dab, you know, in the, in the middle of the mess. So that's what happened. And the reason that's important is that I didn't buy it during that. I bought it slightly after COVID, you know, everything started changing it back a little bit, but still you got to understand that stuff was sitting in warehouses towards the end too. So it's going to be out there. Uh, <laughs> Brian says loose, uh, screw loose, not fell off story of my life. Yeah. It's not the end of the world. You know, um, the, uh, ultimately all I care about is how it sounds and functions and will it will last. And of course those things are not even something you can see. And I actually, again, applaud the way they, um, kind of solve the problem. You know, I mean, they could have not made the amp and I could have just ended up paying twice as much for it. And I wouldn't, I would have done that, but I could have paid more for a used one instead of having an opportunity to get a used one. So there you go. Um, uh, let's see. Um, I'm sorry guys. I'm reading a bunch of stuff. I actually have some moderators sending me some questions too. So let's, uh, let's grab this one from Amanda real quick. Amanda sent me from Brandon. He said, Hey, I bought a new amp PV classic 20 mini head and a matching 212 combo. Okay. It has two inputs in the back of the head for foot switches. Can you get a pedal that will control both inputs? You can. Um, there are all kinds of aftermarket uh, pedals. I don't know if PV specifically makes one, but there are aftermarket pedals that you can buy if you go on eBay and stuff, and you'll see, and that's exactly what they are, are do. You would just need to know, um, really all you need to know is on those two inputs uh, for those uh, foot switches, if they're mono or stereo switches, you know, what are cables, and they can do it. Um, Joe at Rat Pack Records sent me one of those uh, kind of modded pedals. He got an aftermarket pedal for a uh, for his Fireball 25, and he sent one to me, and I have it for my Fireball 25 now, and I can uh, I can switch all the functions on the amp with one pedal. So uh, they definitely make stuff like that. It's out there for sure. Brandon, unfortunately, I don't know who does it because um, foot switches are not something I really use a whole lot. <laughs> it's a, it's a kind of a funny thing about uh, whoops wrong button. Uh, it's a kind of funny thing about foot switches. I um. I, uh, I always go, oh, I actually, I never use them. Even when I'm playing live, I tend to just not need the foot switch. I'll, I'll just reach over. Cause like I said, I'm not in a, I'm not playing a set list or I don't have to change mid song and stuff. Usually, like I said, I got a little overdrive going, I clean up and there you go. Um, so there you go. Uh, let's see. Uh, Joe Christopherson, <laughs> how much do you lose on resale value in a new guitar? Um, you know, it's a fair question. This is what you have to think about. All guitars are totally different. Some guitars, you can lose the majority of what you paid for it. Some guitars, you will lose very little. Uh, some guitars, you're going to make money and some guitars, you're going to break even. Um, I can tell you it's based on brand. It, it is heavily influenced by the brand, but it is mostly by 
just all kinds of factors like is it available anymore uh, was it limited run is it unique is it cool is it in demand is it hard to get was it discontinued um, this is one of those things where like i said i tr truly understand the importance of caring about resale value on guitars i i've heard the other side somebody's like i don't care i just buy the guitars because i love it that's great but uh, as someone who, like I said, I, I couldn't have a collection of nice guitars or I couldn't have nice things if I didn't kind of like grow to it over a period of, you know, years and years and years of trade up, trade up, trade up, trade around, you know, and kind of find things and, and kind of find the things that I truly love. Um, you know, it would have been a much different story if every, if I made a lot of horrible purchases where all my money was just gone because I bought stuff that was just horrible and, you know, I'd have to pull new resources, new funds from my pocket. I would have never been able to kind of, you know, cultivate the thing I have now, which is what I really truly love, you know, the type of guitars and amps I really truly love. So I understand resale value is important. Um, unfortunately, it's just not something so easy that you can go, yeah, definitely buy this and you'll always get your money back. It, there's a lot of factors in that. Um, obviously, this there's safety for the most part in brands like Gibson and Fender. Of course, they keep a lot of, there's always somebody. The way you want to look at it, the way I've always kind of looked at it is, think about it like, uh, whether it's Craigslist or Reverb or eBay, think about somebody's going to look right now for a guitar. Well, what are they looking for first? They're probably looking for a Fender and Gibson. Uh, it's why it's why um, it's getting kind of, you know, where you go to music stores now and all you see is Fender, Squire, Epiphone, Gibson, or Epiphone, yeah, Gibson in stores. You barely see a lot of other brands. You know, it's really in stores because the stores know that if somebody's walking in the store they're probably only looking for those two main brands where on the internet you know everybody's looking for all kinds of unique stuff so that's just you know so that's the uh resale thing i try not to you know like i said i i, I think it's a, a very good question so you know and i think it's a very fair question um but it's sometimes not as fun to talk about <laughs> Because it's not the passion part of the of what we talk about. It's more of the, you know, hey, this guitar is a good value kind of deal. I mean, I understand the economy of it. We have to talk about it. We talk about it a lot on this channel, but sometimes um, it's not as fun. Uh, let's see. Uh, and Okay, let me grab another one. Uh, somebody said, hey, Bob says it's the first live vid. Hey, welcome, Bob. Okay. All right. Oh yeah, Brian uh, from Brian S Guitars said he just got the PRS SECE fit and finish was great. I saw you mention in that, um, and you even said that the pickups sound better than you remember. And I don't know if they're ne necessarily better than what you probably remember, but I think that guitar, those pickups, the 8515 pickups that are in those SEs, to me are a little on the darker side. They're very warm and they lose a little of that top end sparkle. And just, you know, these are just my opinions, but I've, I've heard it echoed across the internet. So, you know, a lot of players are, are, are seeing that same experience. Um, that guitar is very bright. So I think those are a great pairing, you know, um, you know, the, 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 uh, it's like a fine meal, you know, <laughs> right? Just this perfect pairing of things to complement each other. I think the 8515S pickups really pair well with that guitar for sure. Um, so I'm glad you like it. It's a great guitar. I think it's, uh, I think it's going to be, uh, probably one of my favorite SE guitars for a long, long time. And keeping in mind, I don't, I'm not using the saying the best one. Okay. I'm not saying anything else. I'm just saying favorite. I really like kind of like a bare bonesy kind of give me a bolt on neck, a body, just something that functions, just go kind of guitar. There's just something I, I feel really I feel really uh, bulletproof with a guitar like that. Like, you know, just lean it up against the wall, throw it on the backseat of my truck. <laughs> just, you know, who cares? I just love guitars where it's just, you know, I can abuse them. Uh, there's just something very liberating about that <laughs> feeling on guitar. Um, and uh, oh, so that's what I like about it. Um, okay, hold on. All right, let me grab, let me grab another question right here. Okay, this one is from Lance. Thank you, Amanda, for this question. It says, Fractal FM9 practice amp or full range speaker, and which one would you recommend? I, I don't know much about, uh, it says or full range speaker, I would say. I don't know, Lance. <laughs> I like Fractal stuff. Remember, it's, 
it's a it's a mentality thing. I don't have the I don't have the the bandwidth in my head to to mess with the fractal stuff. You know, I um I put in my time. Think of it this way: I put in my time. I went through the processors, like I said, Helix, uh, Head Rush, uh, Kemper, Axe I did all that stuff. I, I I figured out what works for me just out of the sheer like necessity of it. It's not a joy thing for me. One thing about those products that I, I really appreciate is I get no real joy from them. Like, you know, like this old Marshall, this, you know, this is a hand wired 20 watt Marshall JMP here. Um, there's just something fun about that. You know, tw tweaking those, essentially there's two knobs, but there's four, right? Two knobs, uh, you, you know, and messing with that and getting something out of it. There's just something I can do that for hours, right? It's like sitting on the beach and staring at nothing for hours versus actually doing something, right? I actually can get, you know, like I said, I get in a good space in my immensely. Uh, the technical technology side of stuff, I need it. I need it for the YouTube channel. I need it for everything else I'm doing in my life. Um, and it's very important to me, but it becomes less fun for me. It just becomes like, I got it to work. Okay, great. This is what I need to do. Um, so there's not a whole lot of, unfortunately, insights. What I will tell you is I really like Tone Junkies TV. I think he's probably the best, uh, person at explain this stuff. When I was starting up my journey down that road, that's where I was resourcing from. It's kind of like, you know, I get it when you guys are like, okay, I'm resourcing how to mod a guitar and you grab my channel and grab some videos. I was doing the same thing with his. It was like, just listen, listen to him, what he's saying, what's important, what's not important. You know, he, he's really diving into it. So maybe, you know, he's a great resource for that. Let's see. All right. <laughs> Got to jump around again. Let's go. Let me go do this real quick. You know what I didn't do? Is. Let me grab a uh, lid face says, Phil, is green your favorite non-metallic color? I don't know what my favorite color is. I tend to own lots of green guitars and blue guitars. Um, I think I... Um, well, let's just keep it easy, okay? I like blue. <laughs> I do like blue. Um, I, it's 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 a great color, and I tend to default to it with guitars. I'll buy a lot of blue guitars. Um, I, I think technically, though, I still own the most brown guitars. I tend to always just, you know, boring guitars are, you know, I get I end up getting them because they play great and sound great, and it has nothing to do with the way they look. It just it happens to work. Um, green, though, for a long time, I fixated on green for many years because it was one of the least colors you've seen. And, you know, like when you had the music store, when you're in the music store all day, okay, and you're staring at guitars all day, and one of the things that happens is when you go home, you just don't want to see anything that um, uh, <laughs> that you were staring at. You know, this wall, um, I've talked about this. This is, and I, I'm very, you know, uh, I think it's very important to know these things. This is YouTube. Uh, you know, I have a, ba I need a background, and I was like, what am I going to do about my background? And so originally I did what everybody else did. I put some guitars or I put some pedals and I put some amps or I did a combination of this. And I go, that's what they do. And then slow over time, I go, you know, I really, I just like to talk more about guitars than amps and pedals, although I like them all. Let's do more guitars. And so I made the wall of guitars as kind of a backdrop. But the focus of this is the backdrop. When I had a store, I never hung guitars on the wall. I would have like one or two for function purposes. And to be honest with you, when I say function purposes, just to get them away from the dogs or the kids when they were younger. Um, the last thing I wanted to do was uh, stare at, at, at the wall. In fact, this is a horrible uh, thing to admit to, um, but one time I woke up at the house and I had, in fact, I did have four or five guitars hanging on the wall and in my, in my room. And I woke up one morning and I saw the wall, I saw the guitars, and I thought I was at the store because sometimes you'd work all, you know, so long at the store, you'd just take a nap, you know what I mean? You'd work, you know, like 15 hour and then take a, a quick little nap and then go back to work. Um, and I thought, I'm, I woke up and for a, like a full minute, I was convinced I was at the store. And I'm like, oh, I took a nap, I'm at the store. And then I realized I was at the house. One that kind of told me maybe I should, you know, take a, take a day off. But more importantly, I told I told my wife, I go, I gotta get these guitars off the wall. So for a long time, I didn't like guitars on the wall. And, and for a long time, I was really hyper-focused on green guitars because they, you know, you just didn't see them at the store. Green is one of the least made colors of guitars, unless you exclude seafoam green. That's really a common color. So I guess that's what it is, Ledvay, but keep in mind, that's just, you know, instinct of trying to think about why I maybe did it. Um, and then also luck with <laughs> the draw. 
just the things happen. Uh, Brian says, happy Friday, new guitar day. Congratulations. Paul Reed Smith S2 Satin Vela. It's a fantastic guitar. It's one of my favorite S2s, the Vela. Uh, I know you've spoken highly of the Vela. Hey, I have. Uh, what does the neck pickup compare closest to? Is it swappable for a P90? Um, I don't know. When I say it's not, I don't know if it's swappable for a P90. First of all, the pick guard, it's not the same cut. It's not the same fit. Um, it's closest probably to a mini humbucker size pickup. So um, it's not going to be a P90 shape. You'd have to route the pick guard, get a new pick guard, either do it yourself or get one. And I don't remember, I'm sure in one of my videos, I pull the pick guard off and we look inside, but I don't remember if there's enough room for the P90 because um, it's going to be wider than that pickup. Um, that pickup, it's basically... Uh, a single coil neck pickup. I don't know what it is. I never really deciphered. Uh, I never really dissected it and looked at it. it. wasn't something I was really curious about. I liked the pickup. It sounded good. And, uh, you know, it wasn't something I'm after. Um, I thought about um, for many years, like swapping it to a mini humbucker or something, but I, I like the single coil tone on it. Um, would I switch it to a P90? I wouldn't, unless you don't like the sound of it. You know, if you think it's too then the only thing that P90 will give you is more mids and more bark than that pickup it'll it'll be less chimey than that pickup uh and it doesn't matter which p90 you get just that's what the p90 will bring to the sound if you're looking for a little bit more you know kind of throaty punch uh that's what that kind of more more <laughs> would give you doing that that'd be my my guess um versus you know my experience with that single coil pickup uh, but i like that pickup uh fret level midnight says do you wait you do any round core strings wait you do any round core strings on your guitars I really enjoy round core uh, feel on my 335. So uh, I'm thinking round core, obviously uh, flat wound strings, right? Because some manufacturers call them round cores. I, yes, I use flat wound strings. Um, most of the time I have flat wound strings on my 335. In fact, that's what's normally on there. They're currently not on there right now <laughs> because they're on my Paul Reed Smith S2 single cut semi hollow. And that's what I have. Generally, I have one set of flat wound strings on one guitar. And I haven't probably replaced them since the last time I bought a pack was when I did a video about them. So I have a video about them that's probably five years old. And um, one thing I will tell you about those uh, what, strings that I love, is especially if you're a bass player, bass, bass, bass strings even more, they, I kind of think they sound great the more, the, the more dead they get. So I will buy a pack when I wind the strings, I always make sure there's excess left on the ends just a little bit. And then when I'm sick of it, like um, like my 335, I was just wasn't feeling it one night. So I pull them off my 335 and I stuck them on my S2. <laughs> so yeah, uh, and that's what's great. I think everybody should try, uh, try some uh, round core or, or flat wound strings. I think they're really cool. They're different and, um, you know, it's really cool. Um, Lu Luminous says no flat wounds on the bass. Um, I have flat wounds, but I'm not currently playing any on a bass right now. The closest thing I would be playing like them right now would be um, tape wound strings, which will um, are like nylon wrapped flat wound strings. The ones I love are from Daddario. I will not play any others. <laughs> okay, so uh, I've tried them all. They're all great, whatever you guys are gonna say. Um, but the technology that Daddario applied to make these strings is beyond fantastic. Um, they have a natural cloth feel to them. They feel like nylon strings versus the cakey, plasticky uh, ones that everybody else has, does. Um, so um, I would love to film the machine that makes them at Daddario, but Jim and John Daddario told me no, I couldn't film that. But um, they're on my stew ham urge right there. So when you're looking right now, it's hard to see uh, for everybody that's listening later. Um, if you look, you can kind of see that white pick guard right there. You see there's four black strings. They look the jet black strings. That's what's on there is tape wound nylon strings. And I use, that's what I use instead of uh, flat wounds. Uh, why? Uh, I don't know if I have a video about tape wounds. If I don't, I will definitely do one for bass if that's something you guys want. It's something I don't mind doing. Um, uh, that I can use vibrato. And so bass, vibrato for me is very important um, because I played a fretless bass for many years. I love fretless bass. But um, I saw a bass player at a NAMM show one year killing it on this bass. And when I turned the corner, what I heard was this really nice fretless, uh, you know, kind of sound. And what I watched him doing was he was doing vibrato on the bass. Um, you can't get this what I call the wah sound as much, but I've learned that 
I like the vibrato on the bass, so it's I like doing that a little bit. So um, that's why I do it. Uh, let's see. <laughs> okay, hold on a second. <laughs> Reading some of the comments and questions are great. Okay. Um, okay, let's go to the next one. Where are we at? Wrong screen. All right. Uh, next one is from Alan who says, it's Friday. Thanks, Alan. I appreciate the super chat. Vim69 says, great job with the Kiesel yesterday. Thank you guys so much. Um, you know, that was a hard thing to kind of keep secret. Although I'm sure, I think everybody kind of figured it out. I leaked a little bit of it to the patrons and, the, and to the channel members. And then I think people start figuring out. Um, if you guys don't know, um, what happened was I was approached by Kiesel Guitars to take the uh, copper penny metallic Delos that I had made. Uh, it was for you guys, it was a year ago because that's when I made the first video or show you've seen it about a year ago, but it was obviously a year and a half or so ago. Um, they reached out and uh, super nice when the Badlands first run sold out, they said, you know, we were looking and, you know, it's like we want to we want to work with you and and maybe make this a signature guitar. And here's the interesting part about this. And uh, it's really cool. And there's a question that came in <laughs> that it will answer the two uh, questions that maybe you guys don't have. So first, um, I, I always like to share the most interesting side of the stuff. I don't really want to talk about the guitar. And, you know, you should buy one too. It's not about that. In fact, what it's going to be about is the opposite. Um, so what happened? So I had them make that color custom for me. It's a custom custom color option. You guys, as you uh, as you may not know, you can contact Kiesel Guitars and also have them do custom colors for you off the menu. Um, you have to get the paint codes from them, but they will help you do that, I'm sure, on the phone. But you can have them do a custom color instrument. They do what's called off-menu stuff all the time. So that's essentially what I did. I had them go, okay, let's make this color. And then I had a wiring, as you know, set up on my copper Fender Strat that I want to duplicate it. I asked them if they would duplicate that, and they did. Again, an off-menu item. Um, so that's it. That's the easy part. Now, what happens, though, is if you guys would call in and order that color on that guitar or that you know wiring or anything like that because it was off-menu, you would be forfeiting your 10 day return. It's a non returnable item because again, you're going outside of the normal things. You're asking for something extra custom. I think that's very reasonable, right? Obviously, if you want something off the menu, you're they they don't know if anyone else is ever going to want this, so they don't want it back. So what happened was uh, they said, hey, if you make it a skew, if we put it in the, in the, on the web builder, people can buy it. And it actually is less money because there's a lot of features on it that they just include with the price. It just makes it easy, right? But also, so it drops the price a little bit, okay? But more importantly, you would they would get the 10-day return policy um, because it would now be on menu, right? And it's not a hard thing to do. And as you guys know, if you're smart, and I think you guys are, some, a lot of you are, um, you know, they build to order. So they build those guitars to order. So it's not like they have to build up a bunch of these uh copper Delos is and then worry about selling them. Um, to be honest with you, it's just, it was the time it took to build it the, on the website, you know, and put it on there as an option. And so it's really cool. The other advantages is, as you guys know, it's good advertising for them because now we'll look what we're talking about, right? A couple people will go talk about this on the internet. We have a video to talk about it. Will you buy it? I don't know, but maybe you'll go to their website and buy something else. So it's good advertising for them. Um, it's really, really cool. Um, so that's what was interesting and that when they reached out, I said, okay, that made sense. In fact, I'll, I have to just tell you, it actually kind of ate at me a little bit when I, when they first asked me, I go, I almost felt like if I didn't do it, it would be horrible because like I said, it makes more sense to, yeah, just put it on there. Now what's great, <laughs> I think it's great. My name's not on the guitar. You don't have to buy it. And it's got like a, you know, somebody's name, there's no name on it. It's just, it's just the it's just they got it they put this the the uh name on the website because obviously they think that's how you're going to find it um but you, if you're buying it you're not buying a phil mcknight uh guitar <laughs> right you're not buying it's not going to be like my name's all over it and stuff um so 
Um, although Steve, who bought the guitar yesterday when we did the live show, um, he, he asked if I would sign it. So I signed it for him. And Steve, that one is actually better than mine. <laughs> so, you know, that one, the neck was just a little bit, a little bit, not thicker, just a little bit more rounder, which I kind of loved a little bit. There's a little bit more shoulder on the sides, just a little bit. And it was just a little bit lighter. If you guys saw, we weighed them. Uh, that was 7.4 to my 7.8. It was resonating really loud. So it was really cool. Now, but don't get me wrong. I've been playing mine now for the last year and I love it. So they're both good. But I'm just letting you know, yours is actually technically a little, a little better than mine. <laughs> so good for you. Um, but anyways, that's what that was about. And I think that's really fun. And then I like the idea of uh, like I said, I don't want to, I don't need to promote, uh, things that you're already going to buy, you know, like, you know, import Harley Benton's SEs, stuff like that. You know, I, I already do that enough on the channel. Um, I like to always like, if I got to attach my name to something, I always want to attach it to something like the Badlands or the Kiesel or something like that, where it's something unique and it's employing some people in the U S things that just, I think are just more important to me personally. It's not something, an agenda for the channel, but it maybe it's a little bit more personal to me that I'm helping that environment, you know, and with this, uh, platform. So that's cool. Um, and, uh, that's, that's the basic thing. But the other question, which we'll add on to this was, uh, this one came actually on the video. And then I think somebody emailed to me, um, but on the video, I noticed it was Arthur Weiss, 8523 who said Phil are you receiving a payment on the guitars sold question mark or being paid in any way question mark uh do you think you mentioned I don't think you mentioned it in your video I didn't um and it says um very er, un oh un un I think it says an uncharacteristic unchar I'm sorry omission omission so he's saying I omitted it I didn't omit it cuz I'm not getting paid <laughs> um it, so I didn't, I didn't feel the need to say I, uh, opted out. So I'd be very clear. They deserve, they deserve. Um, so a couple things that are important. Um, I personally want you to think of it like I'm getting paid cause I am working with them. So there's benefits to me, right? They obviously will send me guitars from time to time. Um, you know, Jeff and uh, the guys took me to lunch, took me and the wife to lunch yesterday and to dinner. I mean, you know, it's really nice. In fact, he offered to let me stay at his guest house, but we decided to stay in a hotel uh, on the beach because we wanted to take a day off on Wednesday, which was really great for us. Um, so, I mean, to say I'm not getting paid is not accurate, you know, right? They are, there is a benefit to me. However, they did ask me, um, they wanted to talk to me about royalties and payment. And uh, I asked to opt out of that. Um, there is a reason for that. It's because I, it's not why I'm doing it. Um, you know, it's not about, I want you to buy this guitar. Um, I, I really just like their guitars. <laughs> um, I see the benefit of what they're saying. I like the conversation we were having. I like the fact that I did a guy to do a factory tour yesterday. It's number 36, by the way, that's the 36 factory I've now toured and videoed. Um, there will be a video of the tour up, um, soon. Um, it's a, it's a long one, so I'm going to give it to the patrons. And then if they, uh, like it the way it sits, I'll, I'll release the channel. Otherwise I'll maybe cut it down a little bit cause it's kind of long. Um, but, uh, um, and of course, like I said, one of the things I told them, and I've actually mentioned this to you guys before, which is instead of a payment, what I'd like to do is just continue our, um, relationship where if I dream of a guitar or if I, you know, uh, you know, can, you know, we can work with the channel and get a guitar on the channel. I like to do that. Keep doing that. Um, so like I said, I really like what they did and that's where I was at on that. So to ask you, uh, to answer your question, I did omit it. Um, but I just wasn't thinking like, oh, I should mention like, oh, I, by the way, I'm not going to get specifically paid on this, um, because I've opted, you know, asked not to. Um, so that's what's going on there. But like I said, be very clear. I say this all the time with all YouTube channels, always assume that they're always getting paid. <laughs> everything's being sent to them. Even me, like I said, I tell you guys all the time because, you know, there's always something and even I can't think of every little detail. You know, I don't know if I don't want to think about it in two months from now, somebody goes, didn't Kiesel send you a free t-shirt? I'm like, yeah, technically, yeah, that's a free, that's payment too. Because remember any compensation is compensation. But um, his specific question was like a royalty deal. I'm not getting a royalty deal. Um, in fact, I would be just as happy, so you guys know, if, uh, and I said it in my video, if you guys want to get, I love that color. So if you want to get a, a Delos in that color, man, do it. If I love the wiring, that's absolutely my favorite wiring uh, 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 setup 
period, hands down. There's no question about that. If you want to get that, I totally understand that. However, if you want to dream up your own guitars, that's what I was doing at Kiesel too. I mean, essentially every guitar, every Kiesel guitar is a signature guitar. Isn't that cool? Like that's uh, what you do. So especially if you sign the back of the headstock, <laughs> you could just sign your own in back of the headstock. You could be your own signature Kiesel artist. <laughs> it's really cool. Um, the, um, and then on a side note, no one asked, uh, cause it's part of this though. I just want to tell you, like I said, I will be sharing the tour with you. I got to tell you the, the, the factory is beyond amazing in the complexity and craziness of what they're doing. I mean, essentially thousands of custom shop guitars a year is it's an unsurmountable task. I actually had trouble processing it, all of it at first, um, because I'm just watching and how they're you know, tracking all of these orders and what they're doing was pretty, really crazy. Um, because like I said, people are doing a lot of crazy stuff on the builders, but then people are off the builders doing even crazier stuff. So really, really cool. Um, and, uh, because maybe Brandon Kiesel may see this later, uh, show, I just want to say, um, I didn't say, I didn't tell them and I'm not going to tell you, uh, but if, uh, the, um, I always notice this in every factory, there's always something unique and their factory had something unique. And uh, I was really impressed by it. And I don't think they knew it was unique, but it, they had a couple of unique things that I'd never seen in a factory before. And one, not the specific thing I'm talking about right now, one of the unique things was, I think I know why their frets are so polished. Stainless steel frets are really hard to get polished smooth and not have any kind of marks or tooling or scratching in them. And uh, a really impressive the way they're executing on that. I think it's really cool. So there you go. Um, Oh yeah, see, United Effects says uh, Kiesel will put your name on the Trust Road cover for ten bucks. There you go. See, you can do that. Like I said, I opted out. Like I said, no, I didn't want the name on there. Um, I love the idea that uh, I've said it before. I don't. I'm not holding any punches back when I've said this. I think Kiesel is the most affordable USA made guitars that you can get. Um, I'm not saying they're cheap. I'm not saying anybody can buy them. Um, but here's what I will tell you. Um, the guitar that I built that essentially is a dream guitar in my head, the guitar I dreamed up, the color, the crazy color, the wiring, the stainless steel frets, the cortison maple, um, the carbon fiber rods, the whole nine yards, right? The top of the line electronics, the, that's the most expensive electronics you can buy in a guitar, period. There is no more expensive. <laughs> There's nothing better. There's no tier above that. Um, that guitar fully loaded that I'm pointing at right now is $29 more than a Fender Ultra without the stainless steel frets. And uh, it's not, a, I'm not dogging the Fender. I'm a huge Fender friend. There's my Fender right there. What I'm saying is, is that it's impressive that Kiesel, um, which by the way, to give you a reference of size, uh, Fender in 2024, I'm just picking next year so you can understand, and their first 10 days of business will have made and shipped more USA made guitars out of that Corona factory than Kiesel will make in all of 2024 in their first 10 days. So you understand the scale of size and to see that it's an, it's an interesting that they can build you custom guitars that you can actually get. In fact, you can get a Delos if you don't want all my crap, get your own Delos <laughs> with a with a better, in my opinion, better quality components uh, and it will be cheaper than what Fender is producing for you right now, which is impressive. And again, that's not saying you shouldn't get a Fender. I love Fenders and they're, you know, but I'm saying it's impressive to see that they pulled it off. So there you go. That's my thought. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, Steve. Okay. I guess Steve, I got your question in, in, in the email form, but, uh, he, he gave it to me right now. He goes, how does a 410 cabinet differ from the 212 cabinet? Um, and he's, uh, he's basically been searching for a 212 with cream backs, but he's found a 410 cabinet, uh, as it scrolled. Uh, with the same price, but he never had a 410. Look, there are different animals, okay? So different speakers are different speakers, but let's just keep things easy. Even if the 410, which I don't know if you're specifying specifically, was also creambacks, a 410 creamback cabinet is going to sound much different than a 212 creamback ba uh, cabinet. Um, the uh, 410 cabinets are, to me, they do a lot of things. First, they add a little bit more mid, uh, and punch a little bit more thump. Okay. Um, not like bass. Don't think of it like wolfing, like a bass sound, just like a, you know, think about your, uh, your, the, the, your pant leg flap, <laughs> you know, think about the air just hitting you a little bit harder. Um, there's a little bit more on that, a little tighter sounding too. Um, 
there's a lot of positives. In fact, I, I actually prefer a lot of things to a, on a 410 cabinet over the 212 cabinet. However, one of the things, because I like the mids more than the low-end frequencies, um, the uh, one negative, in my opinion, of the 410 is um, on a lot of amps, and a lot of them, you'll get more fizz out of your distortion because the cones on the 10-inch speakers are going to kind of distort and um, maybe more because they're moving more. I'm not sure what's actually causing it. I'm not a speaker expert, but I will tell you right now, whether it's a 110 versus a 112 or a 410 versus a 212, you will get more distortion. So you can adjust the amp a little bit, maybe kind of tame that beast, so to speak. Um, but if that's something you don't like, the fizziness, um, that's one thing I like and dislike about 410s. But um, I wish I could tell you, you know, it's one thing if you ask me, do I like 410 cabinets? The answer is yes. But would I pick a 410 um, because it was less money than a 212 and I wanted a 212? I would get what you what you want. Um, like I said, the, the 410 is great. But if you have a 212 in your mind and the way it's going to sound in your mind, you're not going to get the same thing out of that 410. It's going to be a different sound. So... Let's see. Um, all right. Hold on a second. We're all over the place. What else? Uh, do, do, do. Okay, let's go to the next question. <laughs> hold on a second. Um, hold on. I'm trying to get back to the... All right. Let's go back this way. I feel like I'm, sometimes the screens are just all over the place. All right, uh, Dan says, I bought a Marshall Origin 50 head. Do you have any experience with it? I heard it's a good pedal platform. Yeah, it's a good pedal platform. You know, I hear mixed opinions on those amps. You know, I hear from the amp tech side that they're kind of crappy built kind of things. Um, I hear from friends who just play guitar that they love the way they sound. I think uh, the ones I played through sounded pretty good. Uh, I think it sounds good stuff. Um, I have differing opinion, you know, it's, here's how I think of things. I think of things like a relative to cost, you know, um, it's, you know, it's not a $3,000 hand wired Marshall amp. And so it's not going to last like that, but it's also not going to cost that. I think the origin's a great amp. Um, and when I say great amp, I mean, relative to its price and availability and what, you know, it's a good amp. Um, I like it. Um, like I said, I've heard negative things, and I think most of those things are probably true, but I also I think that's factored into price. You know, they're mass producing those as a more affordable uh, type of Marshall amp, but it's good. It is a good pedal platform. It's a good sounding amp. I like it. Um, you know, it's not everything can be a Rolls Royce, <laughs> right? But it's a good amp. Uh, I don't know. Destructo. I just got it. It was like weird. I see, phonetics work for me. Does Destructo says with a Z. Uh, hey, Phil, happy Friday. I was wondering, who is your favorite guitar player, and have you bought any gear just because they used it? Yes, and yes, my favorite guitar player is Monty Montgomery. Um, and yes, I own a Boss Blues Driver because of him. I own an acoustic amp because of him. <laughs> I don't own a Monty Montgomery acoustic guitar. They're very expensive. They're made by Yuri, uh, Alvarez Yuri. Um, and... Um, uh, not for any reason, and to be honest with you, it's a really cool guitar, but I, I don't necessarily, you know, I don't specifically want it, but uh, Monty's awesome. Um, he's tough, and here's why he's tough. Okay, he's a tough guitar player um, for that question. Uh, I have seen Monty play live. I have seen him play through two Crate acoustic amps and a Boss Blues Driver, and I've seen him play through Boutique acoustic amps with some other kind of more boutique-y pedals. He always sounds amazing. <laughs> He doesn't, you know, when somebody's like, it always sounds like him. It does sound like him, but I mean, he sounds amazing. He knows to dial in his gear, okay? He knows how to dial in his sounds and get the thing he wants. Um, and, uh, you know, so he always sounds great, and he can really get stuff working for him. So um, it's, uh, he's great. But he's not a gear, uh, well, he's not a gear snob, obviously, but he's not a gear, he doesn't come across like a gear guy. He's not like, you know. Like, you know, John Mayer and Joe Bonamassa, they're amazing guitar players, but they're gear guys. You know, they're like, and, <laughs> you know, so there's a little bit of that. Um, some guitar players I, I, I love, you can tell they're just like, that's not their thing. Um, 
you know, the worst thing if you ever, if you ever end up starting, if you, any of you start a YouTube channel, have to interview certain guitar players or do anything, which I've had to do over the years, which is really great. You get to meet some great people, but you, I've had an experience now more than, more than a little where <laughs> I'm talking to some amazing guitar player of some sort who's not into gear and it's a gear channel and it gets really tough, um, to have a conversation um, because they don't care and they don't know and they don't want to know and it doesn't matter to them. And you know what? And their bliss is that, you know, and I'm happy for them, but it's tough when I'm trying to make content like, Hey, uh, it's an interesting pickup. Why'd you pick it? Ah, it was gold. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, you know, Hey, Oh, you picked uh, 22 frets instead of 24. Why'd you pick 22 frets? I don't know. That's what they handed me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not making this up. These are real things that have happened to me over the years and real answers I've received to questions. You know, you're like, oh, do you find yourself playing? And, you know, <laughs> so, and that gets a little tough. Um, so Monty Montgomery is amazing. And I don't really get that he's like a, you know, uh, you know he's not going to sit there and talk about, you know, whether or not his cables are cutting his high frequencies. <laughs> He's not that kind of guy, but he's amazing. I highly recommend Monty Montgomery to everybody. He's amazing. He's a he's an acoustic guitar player and singer. I think his voice sounds a lot like Billy Joel. I think his guitar playing sounds like Eric Johnson, but he's doing it on an acoustic, which that and alone is already really cool. Definitely different. Um, so there you go. Uh, yeah, yeah, LPD says, why did you use that pickup? It fit in my cutout. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, I've had those conversations. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's tough to have a gear channel and do that, right? <laughs> It'd be like having a, you know, a makeup beauty channel and you'd be like, hey, what are you doing? What's your routine? It looks so great in the morning. And they're like, I got out of bed and I went and got coffee. You know, like, oh, well, that's not going to help anyone. <laughs> so, uh, grumpy guitar, Mike, grumpy Mike guitar, my, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm dyslexic today. It says, uh, congrats on the PM Delos. Could you talk a little about why you like the pickup combo in yours so much? Sure. Um, that is easy. First of all, the wiring. Okay. So the wiring is a hybrid of two guitars. Okay. So I didn't come up with anything. Um, uh, the, uh, to me, I don't need to reinvent the wheel. I just can use what people have done. Um, the wiring in the PM Delos is a combination of the John Petrucci wiring in his guitars and the Johnny Highland, Paul Reed Smith. Now this is where it gets confusing because Johnny Highland is also with Kiesel guitars. Now that is not a wiring he uses with his Kiesel guitars, nor did he when I think he was with music man. Um, so when um, I worked on a customer's Johnny Highland PRS about a bazillion years ago, I mean, like, I have no idea how, I, <laughs> this is a long time ago, okay? Um, but uh, I um, took notice that the switching was different and the way it was wired was, is a three-way switch in down, in down position was bridge and middle was um, bridge and then neck split and then in forward was neck split. So basically he always had it set so it would go to single coil mode. He didn't have to pull a switch or anything. He just, he moved, went to the humbucker uh, bridge to the uh, humbucker neck, it was coil split. And then he would have push pull pot and he could t take the single coil split sound from the neck pickup and put it back to humbucker. I absolutely love that idea. And then uh, one of the things I really love on Petrucci's guitars is that he would have his switch, his three-way switch as set up as default without any push pulls or anything as the bridge in the down position was the humbucker bridge and the middle was two single coils. And then in the neck, it was humbucker. So those are, those are two wiring things that I liked. And I thought, oh, what if those were together? It's a Reese's peanut cup or, you know, butter cup, right? Peanut butter and chocolate, I'm already on board. So I wired one, uh, a pick art up like that. And I threw it in my Fender cu uh, custom shop, Copper Strat. That's what you guys saw for years. And, uh, and uh, anyways, I, uh, I liked it that way and I did it that way. And so when I was uh, thinking up the, the Delos, cause they sent me a headless Delos and I loved it. And I was like, okay, let's do a headstock Delos. I go, hey, could you wire this for me? Can you just do it? Because I'm like, you know, I was thinking like that would save me a lot of time <laughs> from them shipping it to me. And then I just take it apart and do it myself. You know, I was like, hey, can you do it? And they did it. So that's what that wiring. So I absolutely love that wiring. Now the pickup combination had nothing to do with that guitar. It has to do with the, that fact that I've reviewed so many Kiesels. I just learned that that's what I like. The, the I like their beryllium in the, in the, in the neck. Um, you know, here's the funny thing about Kiesel guitars and the perception people have on those pickups. And, uh, here's why, 
Um, I said it, I've said it before. If you guys watch, I have a, like a five things or whatever, you know, thing you don't know about Kiesel guitars video. Um, Kiesel started out as a pickup manufacturer in 1946. That's Jeff Kiesel's grandfather, right? Um, obviously everybody remembers Carvin. Carvin made the 11 screw pickups. They designed their own pickups. They built their own pickups and they sold pickups. Some people love Carvin pickups some people don't, but you have this, uh, lineage there. The Brilliams are very PAF, which as you know, I love PAF pickups. So the Brillium in the neck is just a PAF. The um, Lithium in the bridge to me is very JB, another pickup I like. It's very, I'm not saying it's, they're clones of those pickups. There's subtle differences, right? Um, and uh, so it's a little bit more aggressive and I like that. So that's why I started doing that on the guitars. And so it was a shot in the dark when I ordered my Delos. I just said, yeah, let's do the Lithium in the bridge and the, and the Brillium in the neck and I'll see how that goes, right? I'll, I'll, I'll swap if I don't like it. And I absolutely ended up loving it. Um, cause like I said, the little bit more aggressive pickup in the bridge. I like it when I take the, the tone knob and roll it just a little bit back cause it's got a trouble bleed. So I don't lose the highs, uh, the lows. Yeah. You know, I don't lose the highs right, uh, right away. I can turn it back and I, I still get a little bit of clarity. Um, so that's why I did it that way. Really, really cool. Um, by the way, I wish, I wish so much, so, so much, uh, that I could just take credit for this. I, Jeff. Jeff Kiesel said the greatest thing I've ever heard in this entire industry yesterday in the tour. If so when you watch the tour, look for it. He says it. I want a shirt that says this. Um, we were talking about pickups and the history of pickups. And uh, yeah, I asked him a question about pickups and he said, pickup, I'm trying, I'm, I'm going to quote him. This is what he said. He said, pickups aren't magic, they're math. I absolutely love that. I want a shirt that says pickups are not magic. Their math is the greatest thing I've ever heard ever. Do you know how, and I'm just, give me my five seconds, please guys. It's since it's my, my show, I mean my soapbox. I am so freaking sick of hearing every effing freaking stupid factory tour I've ever been in. Tell me about the unicorn powder they sprinkle on pickups. Uh, <laughs> I've told you guys before when I make pickups and you guys buy them, I'm I have to overcharge you because I just don't have the time to wind them. So the, t the price you're paying is, is just, it's cause it's me and that this it's not, not based on the materials I'm using. It's the materials. Like I said, I could have, if I could, if I could, uh, have somebody turning them out at any kind of level, I could get them down to $99 made in USA. No problem. Right. Um, but you know, I'm really just, I really get burnt out. I love, listen, pickups are a recipe like any recipe and the recipe can really be effective right? Um, absolutely. But I'm really tired of this. I've discovered a thing that no one knows about. And then we found old dinosaur skin scales and we turned them into bobbins. And then that's what made the pickups have the magic dinosaur bobbin tone. And so when he said to me, which is on the video, pickups aren't magic, they're math. I have just never heard anyone say it so just it, like I, I feel relieved and I'm going to just now on that's my I'm going to steal it from him. OK, but anytime the next time I don't care who it is, I have to sit at a table in a chair and somebody goes on a tangent about this magic pickup thing that they figured out the universe that it does something that no other pickup can do ever. I'm going to be like, they're not magic, they're math. <laughs> oh, I love that so much. I love it so much. Um, and, uh, and that was great. And so, you know, if you really want the full quote, I'll, I'll, I don't want to, I shouldn't ruin the fact tour, but when we went to tour the pickup winding room, he asked me not to film anything on the walls because it was basically all of the formulas for their pickups. And that's when he said, obviously it's not magic, it's math. And he doesn't want anybody to know his numbers, right? His input His in other words, he had his recipes on the wall and he's like, look, I'm not buying magical stuff. I just put it together the way I like it. And I don't want anybody to copy the way I'm doing it. <laughs> so I'm like, I totally understand that. That's exactly the truth. That's the best way to explain most of this stuff that's out there, this stuff. Somebody has a recipe. Uh, they put their capacitors, they are, their wire, their things together a little bit differently than somebody else. And they and it sounds really good. And But I, I, I wish we would talk more in that language and less in the, I found the magic component that was in... <laughs> It was in Asia and I went through the jungle and, <laughs> and then I found it the last, 
Um, and then since I'm done, I'm doing the tirade. I got to do my last one. And I, another thing too, I wish people would stop telling me they found this magical, uh, they always go, oh, I found this pickup wire. You can't even buy it. I found it. I found a warehouse full of it. It's from a thousand years ago, back when wire gave everybody cancer. And that's why it's better. Uh, <laughs> that's not what they say, but that's how it sounds to my head. Okay. I have, uh, I have, uh, I just, like I said, I, I had a little relief hearing that a terminology because like i said i don't usually get that i get the market copy magic unicorn speeches so i appreciated not getting it plus that's a great name for a t-shirt that's a great t-shirt for sure um so maybe i'll ask him if i could steal it and we can make some <laughs> we give the money to charity i don't even care it's not about money it's about like we'll give them we'll do a t-shirt run and i'll give 100 percent of the money to whatever charity jeff kiesel picks uh Litvay says, are uh, uh, all your non-metallic kiesels... Oh, are you already, I, already, I already answered that. Did you already ask it twice? Okay. Um, Blues Boy Vass says that kiesel... Wow, we're back on kiesel. That kiesel cost, cost to quality ratio sounds like a Gordon Smith. Gordon Smith is definitely... Look, the Gordon Smith, you guys don't know, they're handmade in the UK. He says that on there too. Very, I played a Gordon Smith at the 20... 18 summer nam show it was fantastic um you can watch that video the tone king they gave it to the tone king i was there when they gave it to him and uh, he did a video on his channel and i got to play it before you know he put it in the case and, and and took it to the airport um and it was absolutely fantastic um and the the reality is like i said the reality is is this most of you most of you um watching this show later look the majority or listening to it, i don't think but if you take fifty thousand uh, people right musicians the odds are fifty thousand of you are looking for a more affordable alternative to your guitars and your amps and i think that's important and that's why i focus on that that's why you know what can 20 years of fixing guitars help with looking at a 200 dollars guitar let me see what i can do to help you guys okay um let's Especially when you're trying to stick to a budget, I think the when especially when you're trying to hold to a budget, the screw ups of losing money are even more exponentially painful. So I understand why fixing a guitar is much better than you know losing money or going the other way. Um, so like I said, that that is something I like to do on the channel. Um, but you gotta understand in my in my you know kind of here in the chest a little bit, I have a love for you know Texas Toast guitars. Um, you know, uh, uh, Kiesel guitars, um, even Sir guitars. I mean, and they're kind of on the, you know, right. Uh, Gord, uh, Gordon Smith, um, nags, you know, um, because these are the small mid-sized builders and I'm leaving a ton out, but you can go, Oh yeah. You know, B bell tone guitars, by the way, uh, so that I did use the bell tone this week too. And, uh, I put a link, he's actually got five in stock. So he let me know in a text. He wanted me to know uh, and share that with you guys. So I said, share it. Uh, I'm going to share it this week and next week. I'll let you guys know. Just check out the link and the bell tones. Because um, again, he's same list of what I'm talking about. Sorry, right? Same, same builders that essentially the downfall is I review them on the channel. I talk about on the channel. Even this Kiesel signature guitar video will not get, you know, I can get a half a million views on an Epiphone, which is fine. Because that's what most of you are buying. Because that's a it's a good guitar, especially when you you factor in value to dollar to return what you get and your budgets. And I understand that. Um, but I'm never going to stop trying to highlight the mid and small builders, even though their guitars are very expensive. But it's not expensive because they're driving Ferraris, you know, right? Like I said, they're not they're not they're they're just working, they're just working, trying to make it work, <laughs> you know paying the OSHA bills and whatever things they got to deal with, you know? So like I said, we'll always highlight them. So yeah, of course, Gordon Smith, check them out. Um, there's tons of brands and some, I love it when I talk about the stuff, you guys always put even more brands in the comments and please do them. Like I said, highlight them. We need to highlight them. We'll always do it all. That's why I don't have any rules on the channel about not, I don't care if a company has been mean to me. I don't care if a company's, you know, whatever. I, I, I don't care what the, the, well, I don't want to say what they're, you know, as long as their views are ethical, um, they're on the channel, right? We highlight everything because we're all just a bunch of musicians who love the instrument and music. And I, I have, you know, like I said, almost I'm coming up, I'm on two days, two decades now experience of working on guitars. And here's what I've learned. I've enjoyed working on a guitar that was $99 as much as I've enjoyed a 3000 or $5,000 guitar. I've enjoyed working on them all. I've enjoyed talking about them all. You know, I think they're all fun, right? I think it's fun. It's all fun. So, like I said, um, 
Yeah, and, and basic also Blues Boy Vass was saying that the the uh, uh, Gordon Smiths are less than a Les Paul standard. Of course, of course, and probably better made. But that's what I said. Uh, that's why it's a good point that you pointed it out. It's a great company. And maybe we'll get one on the channel. Maybe I'll, 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 I'll buy one uh, and get one on the channel or I can borrow one, something like that. We'll figure it out. Like I said, I try to put as many of that stuff on the channel as possible too. Uh, Fred Level Midnight says, love my Maybach Lester 60, but feels feel like the pickups are too muddy. Looking to replace the uh, with bare knuckle mules. I love those pickups, uh, which I feel are a little punchier thoughts. Uh, look, I'm a huge bare knuckle mules guy. Um, the bare knuckle mules are what's in my nags that I can't point to because I was behind this one right here, this beautiful nags right here. That's what's in there is mules. Um, that was the first time I played the mules, I believe, and absolutely loved them so much. I bought a set of mules and I put them in my Paul Reed Smith S2 semi hollow because uh, <laughs> I, I like them. Um, and it added a little clarity and brightness to the guitar that I like. So, yeah, I like those pickups a lot. Uh, Ray says, hey, how to keep a Kaler in tune? The low E always goes out of tune. Um, you know, I don't know. <laughs> sounds like, sounds to me um, that because it's one string and not all of them or something like that, it could not, it may not be your actual bridge. Um, you could have the locking nut slipping. You could have the tuning key slipping, and uh, that could be the issue. It's a little difficult of a question because I'm not looking at the bridge. I'm not hugely versed in Kalers, by the way. I've only worked on, I will say a dozen, and I'm rounding up by at least one or two in my life, Kalers, because for the bulk of my life repairing instruments, Kaler was out of business. Um, so most of the time dealing with Kaler for me was, oh, you're missing this part. I'll go on eBay and see if I can find used Kaler parts and I would find it and try to put it together. So I actually have more experience taking Kalers out of guitars than I do fixing them because they were a nightmare to do that by the way too, but you just couldn't find parts forever until Kaler came back. Now Kaler's back in business again. They're, uh, they've been in back in business for oh, at least 10 years because uh, obviously if I've been repairing for 20 years, it about halfway through my repair life is when all of a sudden Kaler, I could get Kaler parts again. And then, uh, you know, you just didn't see them relatively. I, you know, it's, you saw a lot of Kalers on a lot of eighties guitars and, and, uh, I've said this before in the repair business, you work on a lot of cheap guitars more than you do expensive guitars. And a lot of cheap guitars have knockoff bridges and stuff. So the Kaler just wasn't a real a one. I have a whole lot of experience, but, um, I'm just going off a of guess just to start you on a journey. <laughs> uh, if it's one string having a problem, I would look at something that isolates that string. So th this is my logic, by the way. My logic is, is that if all six strings are touching that bridge, but only one is having the problem, let's look at the thing where that one string is isolated. So for instance, that one string would be, uh, well, the B and the E would be clamped on their own uh, clamp on the nut and that's, you know, that clamp could be a problem and maybe you're not noticing on the B. Or like I said, it could be the tuning key because that's directly connected to that one string and not the other strings. That's, like I said, the, the first rule, <laughs> the first rule, if you, if you want to learn to repair and make money doing it, the skill you need the most is to start the diagnostic logic in your head. And so that has no, that, that doesn't have, you don't have to have tools for that. You don't have to do, you don't even have to be very educated. You just kind of think. Like I said, look at it like a problem and just start going, okay, what is different about this than something else? And how do I, what's the first step? And then you start, you di start all diagnostics start the same way. You start with a simple, this, you know, Occam's razor, right? Given things all being equal, the simple solution is probably the right one. So you go, okay, this is probably the, the best, the first thing that could probably be easy, right? Like maybe the tuning key slips when I tune it up, or maybe a screw is stripped out on that one, on that one uh, saddle on that bridge. Like I said, if it's isolated one string, find everything that touches that one string and see if everything is fine. And then, like I said, work through that process. And then what's great is, and I've said this before a long time ago, but it's great to recap this stuff. Then if you have, you get to a point where you can't fix it, imagine now when you go to a guitar tech or a luthier to have them fix it, you can now start them with what you did. You can say, look, I checked this, 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 and this. It's not working. And you hand it to them. Um, some, you know, might ignore everything you say because they just like, hey, I know everything and I don't need to listen to you. But a lot of them, if they're smart, <laughs> they're going to go, okay, cool. And from that, they'll might have another idea or more importantly, they can start their diagnostic process from what you've given feedback. So 
There you go. Okay. Um, Kent Poodles for... <laughs> what the hell? Kent Poodles for me. <laughs> Great name. Uh, it says, hey, Phil, will PRS have new SE models next year besides the two CE Custom 24s and Swamp Ash models? Thanks. I... I don't know. So I, my, my understanding is most likely Paul Ray Smith will not be at the January NAM show. That's I, I, they might, I, I haven't asked them. I'm just assuming that's probably not something they're going to do, but I could be wrong. A lot of companies are returning to the NAM show in January this year, but I don't think Paul Ray Smith won. Um, so they might not have a January launch. Um, so I, I can't imagine they're going to have another SE launch that soon in January. Uh, if I was going to guess, and this is why I told you guys, if they send me stuff, I tell you guys, I can't comment like, Oh, I can't tell you guys. Cause, but right now I don't have any information. They don't have anything sent to me. They're not asking me to do anything. So I can, I can guess like all of you. So my guess is considering that the Tremonti amps like two years, three years <laughs> in the making of the 100 watt head. Um, and they came with the SEs. Maybe that's what's going to be next. They'll come out with the Tremonti, uh, amp, the Mark Tremonti, hundred watt head January would be a good time for that. I'd guess. Like, I think maybe that's what they'll, they'll do. I don't know. See, it's really tricky because since the, since COVID obviously, and since the NAM show decline, what you're noticing is, and if you ha haven't noticed it now, you're going to definitely notice it next month, uh, that most companies now have switched the drop from what was always January, all new product in January to now fourth quarter, which is October, November. I say that because like I said, I could tell you, I can guess, here's what I can't guess about. Oh my God, there's so many products coming out. <laughs> so many launches. Um, I, I am beyond swamped, beyond swamped with new release products for the next uh, few weeks to, you know, month and a half for the rest of the year. And I, I probably didn't even say yes to 20% of them. So, I mean, you can imagine how many products are coming out. Cause like most of the stuff I was like, I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm not interested or, you know, either don't have time or don't, I'm not interested in the product. Um, but just what I have downstairs <laughs> is just, it's, it's a stack. Let's just say that of stuff coming out. A lot of stuff all over the price. I always, I was picking. So you guys know when I say I can't do it or I'm not interested, it had to do with price points. I try to, um, keep the channel like, uh, 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 like a roller coaster. No, it, look, I just did a, I, I just did an amazing Amplified Nation amp that's like, you know, insanely expensive. So the next amp video you're going to see is a very affordable amp, right? That's what I try to do. I try to mix it up. <laughs> I don't want to bombard everybody with $3,000 guitars and I don't want to bombard everybody with $300 guitars. I want it to kind of be, uh, everybody can find something interesting. Plus it's just good for me, you know, for, it keeps, it keeps it fun for me. What am I going to see next? Every day is a new, you know, kind of new crazy thing to check out. So uh, let's see. Uh, Gas Addict says Kiesel has broken links when checking their ordering policy. It's possible. Um, when I was there yesterday, because so you know I got back at two forty, no two thirty eight this morning. <laughs> I left dinner with Jeff Kiesel and the guys, and my wife and I drove straight back uh, <laughs> because I. Um, I, I screwed up when we went to the Grand Canyon and we got up that morning on Friday and then we hit traffic and we missed today's show. And I told her, she agreed with me that if we got up today in the hotel room and even if we got out by eight, we could, you know, if something goes wrong, we'll miss today's show. So I, I go, we got to get up. We got to wake up in our own bed tomorrow. So we're, I'm already in the house, you know, today. So we left late, but so, you know, when I left them yesterday, um, their, I think their web developer was on site and they're doing all kinds of stuff, you know, so you, um, the, the website's a, a big deal for them. It, uh, it costs an insane amount of money. And it's a lot of resources for a company that size. It's a big, huge cost. So I'm sure they're, they're working on it. Um, yeah. <laughs> what? This guy, <laughs> I don't know how to say the name. GM Skirto is like, do you have a maid service to keep all that gear free? Dust free? A maid service. I don't have any services. They, um... <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you know what you do? Um, I'll tell you right now what I use. Uh, if you guys don't, uh, know, um, you can use a duster, you know, uh, but I use a horsehair paintbrush. Um, I know nothing about paintbrushes. I went to the, uh, hobby store and I bought the most soft quality paintbrush I could buy 
that wasn't crazy expensive <laughs> and especially one that was at an angle, right? So the, the, the hairs were longer on one side and shorter on the other. And um, I use that and that's how I get into the bridges and behind the tuning keys and I just brush it and that's how I get all the dust off that stuff. And then, um, and it sounds great, except for I forget to do it 90% of the time that I use the guitar and then put it in the video so you just see all the dust in the videos. <laughs> but <laughs> I do it from time to time. Um, uh, BCH says, is there, a, is there a way to show an original guitar design with prototype to a manufacturer's if so, how do you keep it from getting ripped off in the process? Been building for 20 years, but this design is truly, truly unique. So there's two things you can do. First, obviously, the easiest thing is the NDA is a non-disclosure agreement. Um, NDAs can be binding with this, something as easy as an email. It's just a it's just a meeting of the minds. Again, I'm not an attorney, um, but I've done this. I've I've now sa signed and made a. Uh, I don't know, a uh, hundred NDAs and I haven't had a problem yet. Um, you know, my experience is if they're going to screw you, the, the paper ain't going to stop them. <laughs> so, so, you know, you do the paper because it keeps the honest people honest and the dishonest people weren't going to do, you weren't going to be able to stop them anyways. So, um, yeah, NDA just basically saying, Hey, I'm going to show you something, but you're agreeing that you're not going to disclose any of the things I show you. And then of course be smart about it for, and then you need to, you need to write in some time frame that's reasonable. Um, whatever that is for you. Maybe it's one year, maybe it's six months. It's whatever you think it's going to take you to get your stuff off the ground and, and get going. Um, so they can't disclose it and they can't copy it. Um, obviously you can trademark your stuff and have that all fully protected before you go. Uh, that's, that's the easy way. Um, obviously for the Badland stuff, we've, we've done a lot of NDAs, uh, and uh, we've community, community, communicated with companies. And so, you know, um, is, uh, we've even had to communicate with Gibson. So, you know, Badlands has communicated with Gibson about certain upcoming models. And we did exactly that. Hey, we have something to show you. We'd like you to take a look at it. This is what we're expecting to do. We don't want any problems. Um, you know, um, the, I said this before, the reason, one of the things that is interesting about the Badlands project, whether you guys like it or not, some of you guys like me talking about the business side of stuff, some of you guys just not interested in it, it's fine. But uh, either way, we do everything um, uh, very, very the, the correct way because um, I really like sharing that information and we like the idea that once we've done it, it's, it's in, we can give that in, information to other builders and help them too. Because again, it's not about, you know, it's really not a money thing. It's really more of a education thing, an interesting thing. And it's just something cool to do. So yeah. So when we, um, we essentially had to do something like what you're asking for, we had to sit, submit. Now we submitted it to them, not for them to build it. We submitted to them to the, like I said, find out if there was going to be a problem if we built it. So there you go. Um, but yeah, there's all kinds of stuff you can do. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm not Vince says, get it in writing from their legal team. That's where you go to. We went to their legal team. We got it in writing and their legal team was okay with it. They gave us uh, the okay. They said they don't have a problem with what we're doing. So, uh, the, uh, the, uh, what do you call it? The, um, so that's one thing you can do. Like I said, besides trademark your stuff or all that stuff, but an NDA should co cover you for most things. And then, like I said, I'm not an attorney, but also, um, just cautionary thing. Uh, also I don't cost what an attorney costs. So maybe the, the information is what you get, what you pay for, <laughs> but I was going to also tell you that, um, uh, in my experience in this industry, like I said, a piece of paper doesn't stop anybody from doing anything, but you know, they're all there. It's not a, it's not the most ethical industry to be in. So it's a uh, pretty horrible. So be prepared. Somebody's going to try and screw you or probably is going to screw you. So don't go into it blindly. It's a, uh, it's, it's a pretty horrible business. Um, <laughs> um, hmm. the, um, uh, Okay, hold on. Let me grab some. I think I got a question that Amanda sent. Okay. Speaking of cleaning pots. Okay. 
I just found my Morley wall from 1997 and the level knob has dead spots. Can that be corrected? Um, you can try and use some deoxid to clean that. Um, you know, my, my, my first suggestion is to clean service lubricate, you know, right? So go ahead and use some deoxid, um, and clean that out. That's what I would do on that. And then hopefully those dead spots are from, it could be dust. Cause again, you got to imagine it's making a contact point. So then the contact's not happening. That is a potential issue. And you're hoping that's what it is. Cause then when you clean it and service it, you're fine. Um, however, those dead spots can be because it's worn out and then there's nothing bringing that back. It's got to replace the chamber. The good news is this, um, you know, you have to decide the value of everything for yourself, but in me, a can, and you don't have to buy deoxid. You can go down to your local auto parts store and just get, um, electronics cleaner, uh, in a can. I don't like it as much, but it's fine. And, you know, or get it on Walmart or wherever you go to save a few bucks. But like I said, you can get that pretty relatively inexpensive or don't always forget if you have a friend, maybe they'll let you borrow a can <laughs> for a minute. Right. Um, you know, always kind of, I always check my resource friends for silly things like that. And they do it for me too. They're like, Hey, do you happen to have any of this? I'm like, yeah, I have a jar of it down in my garage. You can use some, right. Instead of them going down and spend 10 bucks, you know, you can borrow it. It's kind of nice. Um, but yeah, I would clean it. And then if not, just replace the potentiometer. What well, the good news is nothing on that, uh, pedal that, uh, the old, uh, the a 1997 pedal, uh, which isn't like the old, old ones that are huge. It's still pretty big. You pull that cover off the back. You're going to have to take some things apart because I'm pretty sure I'm trying to think about the last time I was looking at Mori Pell. Obviously a big PCB board in there, but I think the potentiometers are, I don't know if they're mountable. Either way, it's not that hard. It's like easy, <laughs> right? Everything in there is easy to find and desolder and get to, and you can, you can find your way through it. So whether you're, what, no matter what your experience level, that would be a good first probably project to work on. Um, Brian says, what spray lube do you use for pots? I use deoxid. A lot of people recommend the deoxid fader cleaner. Here's what's really funny about that. Um, I use the, uh, whatever I've used in all the videos. I, I bought two cans of deoxid and the last time I bought them was 2014 or 15 ish. <laughs> right. <laughs> you're trying to remember like, I don't know. Right. You know, <laughs> uh, and I'm still using them. <laughs> you know, you don't use a lot of that stuff. Uh, you know, it's a little squirt takes you a long way and there's not a lot of stuff. So, um, that's, and so when I started doing YouTube videos showing deoxid, people would be like, Oh, use the fader one. It's better. And I'm like, Oh, it's probably is. I don't know. But I mean, I've been using this stuff for years and it works fine. And I also have a can of, of electrical component complaint cleaner that I bought from AutoZone. I have that too. So, um, so like I said, I have them both. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. The Antonio says Morley uses, uses light resistors, not common pots. No, you're, you're right. You're halfway right, buddy. Um, yes, there's an optical, you know, whatever laser thing in there. Um, that's what the pedal is using, right? It's not using a potentiometer like like a, a wah pedal that traditionally does sideways potentiometer, but an almost all, you know, uh, the Morley wah pedals, there is some other side controls. That's why I'm saying it's probably not on the board. So like, think of this, what you're thinking about is, is if you pull the back plate off, there's a big PC board. That's where the wah pedals going through. And then there's like, like you said, there's a, I don't know what that is as an optical sensor, right? Like I said, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not an electrician. I don't do that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't do uh, pedals and amps and stuff, but I know what's in there. Cause I've taken them apart, you know, <laughs> enough times. Um, and then, but on the sides of the pedal, usually there'll be a volume knob where you set the volume or a wall control. There's always some kind of potentiometer. Um, I'd say, I, if you go and look on Morley's website right now, the new ones look different than what he's has. But even if you look at those and you'll see, I'd say out of the 10 that they make now, nine of them have at least one potentiometer control. So like I said, you're correct, but I think what he's talking about, um, now you're, now you're also correct. If he's having that problem, it is the optical thing. I don't know how to uh, help him. Um, that might be, um, believe it or not, if it is the optical thing, which is again, usually that's a very off on off thing. Um, it's usually a piece of cardboard. It's like a black piece of cardboard, 
And um, you can mess with your <laughs> Morley Wah pedals by cutting on that with an X-Acto knife. So he might be able to fix that with a piece of cardboard. But I'm getting the, the impression it might be one of the potentiometers that's attached to it. So again, like I said, uh, you could absolutely be right too. We're, neither one of us are looking at it. We're just throwing our guesses at him. But at least we'll get him down the right road. But thanks for pointing that out because, again, you're right. The... The piece of cardboard in there might have got bent, crushed, something, and then it's cutting out in and out. But usually those pots are, you know, that the optical thing doesn't wear out. And it's not like that gets damaged. But it's possible. Like I said earlier, Occam's razor, right? Pots are wearable parts. It's like saying, hey, my car, <laughs> the, you know, my car is riding rough. And you like, you know, check the tread and your, your treads, are, you know, your tires are going to wear out before other components. Um, hey, Phil. Epiphone has, oh, this is from Solar, 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 S-A-L-A-R, uh, says, hey, Phil, Epiphone has a Dave Grohl Epiphone, that's amazing, I added the amazing part, DJ30, DG335 in the works for next year, I can't wait that long, well, you're going to have to, uh, I hope to make it in Pelham Blue, uh, what are my options in the market right now, this is going to be my first guitar, um, I, you know, I can't tell you, I don't know every guitar, but I can tell you right, what I want right now is this, this is what I want, and, um, I will get one one day, <laughs> uh, Uh, where is it at? I'm going to share it with you. It's a guitar I reviewed, but I got the, this right here. Okay. Ready, buddy? Okay. Not exact, but it's what I want. <laughs> so I'll show you what, what it is. Okay. Here we go. It's the D'Angelico Excel DC Tour Semi Hollow. And I'm going to show you two because it's important. Um, this is not Pelham Blue. So it's, it's a, it's a kind of a blue metallic -y. It's got the vibe. I love I love the guitar. I did a review of this exact guitar, but um, the one they sent me was wine red, uh, like this color. And I was like, that's really cool, but it's this. But so you know, um, the one I want is the mini. And that's not, this would be more like the Dave Grohl one. So it's $12.99. My guess is, so you know, okay, I'm gonna tell you some crazy stuff now. All right, let's hear some crazy stuff. I don't know anything about the Dave Grohl Epiphone guitar for next year. I haven't heard any of the rumors. You're the first one person to mention it, but it sounds like something they would be doing. Um, my guess, based on what I just seen from Epiphone rolling out for the last year or two, um, it's going to be about a $1,200 guitar, right? They're going to definitely make 11. I mean, that's what they're pushing for Epiphone guitars. Um, this guitar is cool. I love the way it looks. It comes with a gig bag. It's made in Indonesia. Um, I think it's made in Indonesia, right? Pretty sure. Yeah, I don't think it's Korea. I think it's Indonesia. Uh, it's built really well. Like I said, um, uh, and I really want the mini one, which is the same one, but like slightly smaller, but the mini one would not be the Dave Grohl model, right? So it's got a Dave Grohl by five. There's probably other people out there going to have other great recommendations, but that's, I love that neck. And I, so there you go. Um, I, um, I want the, the, uh, the DC Mini because I really want an ES339. I had one years ago. I got rid of it. I have a 335 alike. I don't want to get rid of the 335 to buy a 339, and that's what it would take. If I got a 339, I would have to sell my 335 because it's like, I, you know, one's got to go for one to come in. Um, but um, I have another hollow body guitar that I'm not in love with so much anymore, and I was thinking about getting rid of that and getting the DC Mini, and that would be my 339 vibe. So there you go. So that's something to consider. There might be others out there, but. I like, I've seen those guitars in person. I've reviewed them. I've deep dived them. You can watch my deep dive. That's the best thing. I, even the, the, the dirty, nasty parts of it, like I, it had a couple of fret issues. There were some issues, right? So watch that video, um, of that guitar. It's wine red, but check it out. And maybe that's, maybe that'll be the guitar for you. So, uh, let's see. Um, Okay, hold on a second. Let me refresh this one. I know I, I'm always telling you guys what I'm doing. You probably don't even, like, what is he talking about? Um, I'm gonna say Music J says, new guitar day, congratulations. Got a used, excellent condition USA Performer Strat for $700. I love the Performer Strats. And an open box, and an open box really, oh, and and, and an open box, really brand new, PRS SE HB2 with the, uh, the, the Paizo. 
um, from Pro Artist Star. Pro Artist Star is one of those uh, ones on um, Reverb Man. Well, you can go to their website too, but you can always get smoking deals. They always have the smoking deals for 900 bucks. Thanks for your review on the PRS, by the way. Yeah, it's a, um, I, I like the, obviously the, I told you guys the, the you know, I got the PRS uh, SEHB Hollow Body 2 with the Paizo. I reviewed it. I loved it. I used Gear Math, which I'm done using Gear Math. <laughs> I Gear Mathed out, done. Uh, I use Gear Math going up. I love it. I love the core more. Uh, like I said, I was COVID. I was sad. I thought, a, a, you know, an expensive guitar would make me happy. I bought the Hollow Body 2 core and it didn't sound as good to me. It still doesn't as the SE Hollow Body. Um, so, yeah. The, the problem is I sold the Hollow Body to get the core. <laughs> So, and it's not like if I didn't sell it, I could swap, I could keep it. Anyways, I can, the core is in, um, it's in my closet. It's been rotting. You've seen the blue one. It's nice. It's just been rotting in the closet. Um, it's a great sounding and playing guitar. I just don't like it as much as that uh, SE. But the sad thing is um, certain guitars like what I did when I bought that core. It's probably going to sit here for a couple years. Um, I don't think much longer than that. Um because here's why it's going to be worth what I paid or more than what I paid in a couple years. So I don't have to sell it and lose money on it. I can just wait it out. So that's, what's great about certain high end guitars. That's like I said, that's the one thing about high end guitars, um, and collectible type guitars is if you get it and you end up not liking it, you can always get your money back, especially if you're not in a situation where you have to sell it to get the money. You can wait. I just wait. And that's what I'm going to do. Rummy says, hey, would Badlands please issue guitars in classic colors like glossy black, alpine white, and candy apple red? Sure, we'll do that tomorrow. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I can't comment. I'm not saying those colors exist. <laughs> um, the uh, Obviously, look, we, they're good. the plan is not to just keep doing the crazy graphics. There's a, a plan to do a... Uh, slightly more obtainable more streamed down version too of course of just the core guitar so of course there's that's cool when that happens i don't know see the the issue we have uh that would totally make sense and i hope you get, i hope it makes sense is we really can't roll out things until we um we give the people who gave us money their guitars <laughs> so 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 like i said there's a lot of ideas on the table and there's a lot of things and prototypes that physically exist and a lot of things that work. But, I mean, you can't, we can't literally go, yeah, we can totally release. Like, everybody's like, what are you going to release now? I'm like, we can't release anything until we get these people their Hollow Flash guitars. And so the people who bought the Hollow Flashes, they're seeing the updates and stuff on Instagram and, and Facebook. Cause, um, but until they get their guitars, we can't release guitars. You see how that works? So, yeah. But, yeah, that's a, it's definitely coming. Um, something's, um, something like what you're asking for. Or something like that is coming in a way that might be exciting. So, uh, let's see. <laughs> yeah, Jay Marble goes. The Tone King had a Badlands promo guitar question mark in one of his videos that had a white body. Mm hmm. Yeah. So you know, um, I can't dog on TK for that. I did it too. Uh, you'd have to, you know, don't, don't. <laughs> uh, just don't because it's not worth the time. But in one of my live shows, if you're paying attention, there's a corner of a guitar like i forget which side of the wall but you can see it and it's a prototype guitar and you can see the color too so yeah you know it happens so um it has to do it's funny it seems like oh they you know he he left it in camera just the same way i did um you set your camera thing and um i have a bigger screen now but i have two screens where i'm looking at. i have a screen here i'm looking at and then i have a small the camera screen sometimes you look at the screen you don't see it and then when you watch the playback, I watch the playback on a big monitor later after the show's done. And I go, ah, crap, it's right there. <laughs> so now I just pull them out of the room so I don't have any problems. Uh, okay. Um, huh. Aussie English says, how do you cure being a gear snob after buying custom shops and PRS cores, etc.? It feels hard to... Bond, uh, to bond, I'm gonna say he thinks, I think it means bond. He put bond. It's hard to bond with cheaper instruments. How do I undouche myself? Um, 
Well, first, that's a great problem to have. <laughs> you know, when you're when you're talking about like, oh, oh man, how do I stop having all this amazing stuff? Um, that's a great uh, problem to have. So a lot of people are probably uh, y y <laughs> appreciate your calling yourself a douchey because that's it. Okay, but here's the important part. Um, your the core of your question actually doesn't have to be what you're saying. Custom shops and PRS core guitars. The question is. You know, um, I've heard it a thousand times if I've not heard it, you know, a dozen times. Um, when somebody says, I have these nicer guitars, maybe they're talking about $600 guitars, and they have this $200 Holly Benton that they love, and they love it more than any other ones, and that's the one they play. Um, I We all experience that. The, the, the idea that the price of something is going to somehow relate to the connection that you have with it is obviously not not, not going to happen. It's not, it's not accurate. It's not likely. Um, that's why clearly, um, I try to have this conversation with there's guitars I, I need and use and love. And then I collect guitars, <laughs> right? Um, because there's just something about, like, I want to try this one type of guitar and I want to like it. Um, so how do you cure yourself from being a guitar snob? Um, you just, you just calm. No, you calm down. That's not the right way. What do you, how do you cure yourself? I think what you do is, is you don't care about, don't focus on what things cost. Just focus on what you like and why you like it. Um, that's kind of like, you know, the, the, the thing I talked about a couple years ago on the sh show that is a tough thing and kind of relates to what you're talking about is you buy something, you buy something, you like it. Like I talked earlier about the gear math thing. I buy some more expensive stuff. And then you can't say you're stuck with it, but you're kind of stuck with it. Cause when you sell it stuff, you can't buy a guitar for the prices that these guitars cost and then sell them for half. It's insane. It's an insane amount of money, especially like I told you guys, if you buy a Gibson, a Fender, a Paul Reed Smith, you name it, if you buy a high end guitar, okay. Um, that has a, a, a resale that has a value to it. That's always going up. And those values are going up because those companies are always raising the prices on the new products. So the used ones go up too. If you don't have to lose your money on it, you can wait. Somebody's like, oh, I bought this guitar for $2,500 and now it's worth 14. I'm like, yeah, but if you wait, it will be worth more. And eventually it will exceed what you paid for it. Now that might be too far out for you to wait, but you, the more you wait, the more you'll get back. So sometimes you just got to calm down and just realize you have it and, and you'll, and, and just not sell it. Um, but as far as like, how do you go down and, you know, to less, at least expensive guitars, you just realize that's the best guitars to have. I don't know. So, I I'm with you. If that helps, I'm with you. I have I have like I I have a video. Tell me in the comments since we're at the end of the show almost. Tell me in the comments if they're interested in this video. I ran it by my wife. She didn't know what she thought of it. You know, it's it's more of a you know, it's an interesting content. I don't know if I have five, but the title would be five guitars I regret buying. I think I have three or four for sure. Well, I definitely have three. <laughs> I have three. I might have five. I have uh, three or four rather expensive guitars that are sitting in my closet that I bought that I don't like. They're they're just they're I don't hate them. They're great. They're just not anything I'm in love with. And uh, I regret buying them, and uh, and I bought them based on this logic of well, for the price and for what they are and what everybody says, and you know everybody buy it's just, these are the holy grail people want. I got them, and I'm just it's not that they're bad; they're probably some of the best guitars ever made. But I don't think they're better than anything I have that I paid a fraction of the price for. And so that's where you have to pay attention, you know. Uh, Grumpy said that would be a great video. I will definitely do it because it, the idea wouldn't be to do the technical aspect because the guitars are great. The idea to be talking about the emotional aspect. What do you, what, you know, I think this is a, a real thing that happens to all of us. You, like I said, you, you buy something and then, like I said, you go, if it's good, if I spend more, I'll be better. I've had this, exp you know, this, this exact thing happen over and over again. Where, and that's why I backed off. I'm done. <laughs> so, um, there you go. All right, um, let's see if there's anything else I need to button up before we go. If there's any 
things I missed. Okay, not there. Let's see about the moderators that I missed. I'm sure I missed a couple, but. Oh, okay. Glenn, thank you, Brian. Brian says, I miss Glenn Cooper's super chat. There you are, buddy. Oh, okay, because it, it came in, but not the question. He says, six string resonates on the fifth string saddles are not touching. Wait, what? <laughs> six string resonates the fifth string saddles, but they're not touching. Oh, okay. So the way I'm reading that question or the problem is, is that you're hitting the sixth string. And when you do that, it causes the fifth string saddle to, to vibrate probably or whatever, right? It's resonating. It's making a sound because of that frequency. Um, so what would be the fix for that? Well, first, first thing I would do, like if, you, if I had the guitar right in front of me, the first thing I would do is something simple. Like I might loosen the fifth string a little bit and shove a, I usually have uh, business cards, you know, just some cards I can cut up, but you can use piece of paper, thin piece of cardboard, something, stick something underneath the two, two points of contact. So you're going to have the, the two grub screws most likely are what's touching the bridge. That's what's pushing the saddle up, right? That's usually what's going to be, it doesn't say what kind of guitar it is, but that's going to be most likely what's going on there. Um, go ahead and put something underneath those screws and why I'm doing that is I'm trying, I'm trying to figure out where the vibration is coming through into that saddle, right? So maybe if that doesn't, it dampens it. If that works and that fixed it, then you realize like, oh, okay, there's your first step. Like we got to figure out how to, how to do this, um, how to dampen that. Um, if it's coming through the back screw, which is your screw for intonation, um, and it could be that spring too, then you might want to see about figuring out how to dampen that, right? Um, trying to think what else. I mean, like I said, usually my first thought is always, let's see if we can just get the problem to go away. Even if that it looks ugly, because like I said, there's something shoved in there or something, because then we know what it is. Because here's the here's the reason why I do that. I, and this is what's in, important about this conversation is, um, I reason I do that is because you might be shocked, I've been shocked many times, where I do something like that. I shove a, a you know a cardboard or a piece of a business card or something underneath the, the screws, the grub screws. And or I isolate the saddle. And then what I heard was vibration coming from there is actually coming from somewhere else. Think about when you're hearing these sounds, sometimes they're not coming from exactly where you think they are. So you kind of, kind of, that's why I said, you want to just eliminate the problem. Like I said, isolate it, eliminate what it's doing, and then figure out if that's exactly what you're hearing. So, uh, yeah. And so I'm just looking to see if there's comments. Some people have other uh, approaches to it too. But like I said, my logic is I, I want to make sure my first thought is I want to make sure that it is actually what you think is happening is happening because I've done exactly what you're probably doing. I've heard it. I've listened. I put my ear like using my ear trying to find the spot. And I go, OK, I know for a fact it's coming there and it might not be coming from that. It might be coming from somewhere else. So. Um, funny um okay so hold on just looking to see all right i think we did it i'm just looking to see if there's anything else in, in anything interesting um like i said i've got a bunch of videos coming so please check for those i will be releasing the keely keely Keely, I'm thinking Keely Bells, Kiesel, uh, uh, factory tour. Um, it was really cool because I asked him a lot of great questions and he was pretty forthcoming. In fact, he mentions many times over that he's done some tours, but he's never done a tour like this. He's never kind of given this much information out, which I thought was really cool and insightful. Um, really interesting to see. Um, and, uh, so if those of you interested in those things, I love it when, uh, um, they, he let me, um, he let me do something that I rare, very rarely never get to do. In fact, <laughs> I'd say most of the time I don't get to do. He let me film the entire process. I'm going to give it to you guys probably most likely unedited unless, of course, like I said, you know, we need to cut down the time. But when I edit it, it won't be, you won't be missing anything. Just maybe some of the walking stuff, you know. But more importantly, um, it's a really in-depth factory tour. It was really interesting. So I 
think you guys might find it interesting. Um, on a side note, like I said, check out the links down below. Um, two things that are important at the end of the show to mention as I'm jumping around here. Just want to make sure that I didn't get an email while we we're on the show. I did not. I have emailed the winner of the Paul Reed Smith SE guitar, the uh, Swamp Ash special, uh, and uh, I am waiting for a response. Once I hear the response, then they win the guitar. If I don't hear a response in the next day or so, I will hit the button and it randomly picks a different name. I don't know the name of the person because I don't know the name of any of you who enter the contest. I only get your email address. Like last week when I was mentioning names, ironically, I mentioned one of the, I think one of the people that didn't uh, email or hasn't messaged me back was named Charles. They weren't named Charles. I guess that was just on their email. I only know what's on their email. So I just kind of assumed that was their names and their emails are the names. This one has an, an email that uh, doesn't, it's like this, you know, these sign-ons. It's just a bunch of, uh, you know, words put together. Um, so we have a winner. We'll hopefully hear who that is, and I'll announce that. And then, uh, and then we'll resume going back to giving some snarks and other cool stuff away. Like I said, we this week we needed to to take a break because of all the stuff that happened this week. Um, please check out those bell tone guitars. So the deal with bell tone is he um, he's a small builder, and I he obviously saw that I highlighted his guitar this week's video with the uh, Amplified Nation, and he said, hey, just let, let you guys know, we normally don't have any in stock, but they actually have a couple, so you can check them out. And uh, those of you interested, you can go on the Kiesel website and check out my signature guitar and the other guitars and see about building up some cool Kiesels and have some fun. Like I said, share them with your friends. That's what I do with them. <laughs> so, all right. As always, I want to thank you guys so much for the Hangout, and uh, I hope you guys have a great weekend. And uh, I'll talk to you guys next Friday. All right. And I guess I got to say, and know your gear.